Yeah, uh, so it has started recording. So welcome back. Uh, let's continue from where we uh, left last time. Uh, so I think uh, we finished uh, the part covering uh, the different ideal and uh, today we will come to the discriminant ideal. So let me start uh, sharing the screen. Uh, please confirm that you can see. Yeah, one of you can please confirm. Yes, sir, it is. OK, good. So let's start. Uh, so today we will cover uh, the topic of discriminant. And uh, this is analogous to different. Uh, so last time uh, we introduced the different, which is an ideal where uh, let me say upstairs. So the picture that you have is a dedekind domain A, its quotient field K, a finite separable extension E, B is the integral closure there. And uh, this is an ideal uh, in B, so upstairs. Yeah. And uh, we saw that it's closely related to ramification. So the two main points. Uh, so uh, what, what were the main uh, things that we did with the different? Uh, different behaves well with localization. It also behaves well with completion. That it behaves well with localization, I said uh, you can easily check it, it's uh, not difficult. And that it behaves well with completion, it requires a proof and I said we will skip it. Okay, so we did not do the proof. If you want, you can check Lang. And uh, uh, so ramification also behaves well with uh, completion. OK, and putting these two together, uh, we uh, understood how different behaves uh, with respect to ramification. So uh, right, uh, we had uh, uh, we had an exact result. No, so we showed that uh, if uh, if a prime is unramified, then it does not divide the difference. And if it is ramified, then it divides uh, divides at least to the order of e minus one, where e is the ramification index. It is exactly e minus one if the ramification is tame, and at least e if the ramification is wild. And uh, what was the main idea of proof? So because of our uh, because of our localization etc uh, localization and also because of completion how because it behaves well with respect to completion we can assume that we can do this locally and locally uh, it's much easier because uh, unramified has a characterization and uh, ramified had a characterization in terms of Eisenstein criterion and uh, ramified extension can be written as totally ramified over unramified and uh, different is transitive. All these things put together, we proved this result. OK, so this is what we did last time. And today we will introduce the discriminant. And this is an ideal downstairs. It's an ideal in A. OK, and uh, these two are nicely related. Uh, it's related to the different ideal via the norm map. So norm of the different is the discriminant of uh, B. You have B over A and uh, you have different of B over A and you have the discriminant of B over A, which we will introduce today. And uh, different is an ideal upstairs. And if you take the norm of that ideal, what you get is exactly the di uh, discriminant. So we will also look at its connection with ramification. And that's what we will do today. So let's start. A as usual is a dedekind domain. Uh, K is its quotient field, E is a finite separable extension, B is the integral closure of A in E, and let N be the degree of E over K, and uh, fix an algebraic closure, and uh, let sigma I from E to K bar be the N distinct embeddings. Okay, degree is N, so there are N embeddings to a fixed, to a given algebraic closure. So let uh, this be any set of N elements, and uh, then we can define its discriminant, so discriminant of this set. So this is a set of some arbitrary set of n elements and its discriminant is given by. So you consider these embeddings 
and you have these elements w i. So you consider the matrix sigma i w j. Ith pro is sigma i w1, sigma i w2, etc. And uh, j is for the column. Consider that matrix. Consider its determinant and take its square. This is the definition of the discriminant associated to a set of n elements. Okay. And uh, suppose V is another basis, uh, not basis, any uh, any uh, any set of n elements. And uh, suppose V and W are related by a matrix, M and K, matrix with values downstairs, M and K. Okay. So that means there is a matrix such that this times V1, V2, etc., Vn, uh, the column matrix is equal to W1, etc., Wn, the column matrix. Suppose they are related like this. Then what can you say? Then it's easy to check. You know, you apply this definition. So this V is a matrix consisting of sigma I Vj and this is sigma I Wj and related by X. So, uh, so the matrix sigma I Wj will be X times the matrix sigma I Vj. So you can take determinant. Determinant is multiplicative uh, and the discriminant is the square of the determinant. So you will get discriminant of w is determinant of x square times the discriminant of v this is easy check this so uh, if w and v generate the same module over a then x actually belongs to gl and a x is a matrix with elements from k but if w and v generate uh, the same module over a then uh, the matrix they generate the same module over a so the matrix changing one to the other will have values in a so x will be in m and a but they generate the same module so x is invertible so x will be in gl and a meaning determinant of x is a unit in a and uh, therefore the two discriminants will differ by if this is true that w and v generate the same module then this will be a unit so the two discriminants differ by the square of a unit in A. Okay, so this is the basic observation. They differ by the square of a unit. So the first, uh, another observation is that the discriminant uh, lies in K. Why is that? So the way I define discriminant is this one. And uh, these WJs are from E upstairs. And you are taking, you know, all these conjugates and you are forming that matrix. You take the determinant, take its square. The claim is that this actually, so clearly this belongs to E, right? But, uh, but, well, it's not clear that it belongs to E. I mean, it belongs to the image of E. I'm not saying E is Galois. E is only separable. But I'm making this extra claim that this actually belongs to K. This thing when you do, it belongs to K. So what you need to do is take, take any isomorphism of E, sigma from E to sigma of E over K, which fixes K element wise and apply to the discriminant. And you will see that it fixes the discriminant. Why is that? So if you take an isomorphism over K and apply to the discriminant, if you apply sigma to the discriminant, you're applying it individually for the matrix elements and then taking the determinant and then the square. So what happens? So each row is sigma 1 w1 sigma 1 w2 etc right that's the first row similarly second row etc if you apply sigma what happens sigma composed with sigma 1 will be some other sigma i right whatever sigma you take sigma will just uh, just uh, uh, swap these sigma i's sigma i will go to some sigma j so the effect of sigma on that matrix is swapping of rows shifting some rows in interchanging two rows so what will be the effect of the determinant when you interchange two rows the effect on the determinant is by a sign so some number of swapping is involved so some sign comes but you are squaring so the sign goes away so sigma is fixing the determinant square so if and this is true for any sigma from e to sigma e which is a k isomorphism so therefore, uh, the discriminant actually lies in K. Every sigma fixes it. So it lies in K. Effect of sigma on the matrix is swapping rows or interchanging rows rather. So discriminant is fixed by sigma. So 
if your W is actually contained in B, W is a subset of E, but if W is a subset of B, then what can you say? You know that uh, if W is in B, so you know that the discriminant belongs to the ground field K, and it, and if W is contained in B, of course, discriminant is also contained in B, right? Because if something is an algebraic integer, any sigma I will map it to again to an algebraic integer. So you are taking product and difference of algebraic integers. So that will be integer. That will be integral. So it belongs to B and it belongs to K. Therefore, it belongs to A because A is integrally closed. So the conclusion is that if W elements of W are from B, then the discriminant actually belongs to A because A is integrally closed. Okay. And we can also see that the discriminant is non-zero if and only if W is linearly independent. W is a basis of E over K. After all, W had N elements, so it uh, and uh, it should be linearly independent, so it spans also. So if and only if W is a basis. Why is that? That is because, first of all, observe that if you have a linearly dependent set, if you have a set, if W is a linearly dependent, then the matrix that you are forming two rows will be linearly i mean the rows will be linearly dependent so the determinant will be zero so discriminant will be zero other way if it is actually a basis then the discriminant is non-zero it's enough to show for one basis right because if you have two bases then there is a change of basis matrix and the two discriminants differ by determinant of x square where x is a change of basis matrix and change of basis matrix is invertible therefore discriminant of one basis and discriminant with respect to another basis uh, they will be either simultaneously zero or simultaneously non-zero because they differ by a non-zero determinant so it's enough to show that if you have a basis it's enough to show that for one given basis the discriminant is non-zero and if e is separable over k and finite you can write it as k bracket alpha primitive element and then what is the most natural basis to consider one alpha etc alpha power n minus one and you write down the discriminant with respect to that basis so what will be discriminant with respect to one alpha etc alpha power n minus one what will be the effect of a Galois conjugation on this? It changes the. Yeah, so you have one alpha, etc. Alpha power n minus one. And you need to check that. Uh, yeah, what is the effect of a Galois element? Alpha goes to some other root of its minimal polynomial. So suppose the other roots are alpha one, etc. Alpha n minus one then alpha goes to alpha 1, alpha goes to alpha 2. These are the Galois conjugates. So the discriminant, that particular matrix will have rows 1 alpha, etc. alpha power n minus 1, 1 alpha 1, alpha 1 square, etc. alpha 1 power n minus 1, etc. So it's a Vanderbilt determinant, which is non zero. So that's all that you need to check. So if E is k alpha for the obvious basis, the discriminant is the square of the Vanderbilt determinant and therefore non zero. On the other hand, therefore, for any basis, it is non-zero. On the other hand, linear dependence implies determinant is zero and hence a discriminant. So this is true. Determinant discriminant is non-zero if and only if the given set is a basis. OK, so you have uh, also the obvious notion of discriminant of a free module. Why? Because if the module is free, you can choose a basis and you can take the discriminant of that set and we can say that this is the discriminant of the module. If you take another basis, what will happen? They will differ by a change of basis then with entries from uh, A and therefore the discriminant will differ by square of a unit. So this is well defined modulo the square of a unit. OK, so we will also talk of for free modules. We will talk about its discriminant. It is well defined up to square of a unit in A. So if your ring is Z, then of course it's well defined because square of a unit is one. So it is well defined. Otherwise up to square of a unit. OK, so let's do a small uh, lemma. 
Suppose M1 and M2 are free modules. So you have the notion of discriminant, which is well defined up to square of a unit. And suppose one is contained in the other. What can you say about discriminant of M2 and discriminant of M1? If M1 is contained in M2, so how is the discriminant defined? For M2, you choose a basis and take its discriminant. For M1, you choose a basis and take its discriminant. How are these two bases related? If VI is a basis for M1 over A, then each VI can be written as a linear combination of WIs, where WIs is a basis for M2. So in other words, if you write the basis for M1 as a column vector, that is equal to a matrix with entries in A times the basis for M2. So in other words, discriminant of M1 will be square of a certain matrix, determinant of square of certain matrix times discriminant of M2. So discriminant of M1 is a multiple of discriminant of M2 in A. Discriminant of M1 is a multiple of discriminant. This is exactly this, this observation. If W is X times V, then discriminant of W is this determinant X square, discriminant of V here, X belongs to M and A. So this will be an element in A. So discriminant of the bigger thing uh, divides the discriminant of the smaller free module. So, uh, so discriminant of W, which is a base, so discriminant of M1 is a multiple of discriminant of M2. So discriminant of M2 divides discriminant of M1. So if M1 is contained in M2, then discriminant of M2 divides discriminant of M1. Suppose you also have, they are equal up to a unit. Discriminant of M1 is a multiple of discriminant of M2. This you know. Suppose the multiple is a unit. Then what can you say? Then the claim is M1 equal to M2. Why is that? Because if, if discriminants are differing by a unit, then what can you conclude? Again from the same formula, the change of basis matrix X. So determinant of X square is actually this u. So if u is a unit, then determinant of x is a unit. So that means x belongs to GLN A. X is invertible. X is, x is entries in A and x is invertible. So you can do the other way also. You will get determinant of M2 is a multiple of determinant of M1. And uh, it will be actually equal. M1 equal to M2. Because you will get x is invertible. So you have a basis for you have a basis for uh, M2 from which you got a basis for M1, but because X is invertible, X inverse W is V. Using that, you will get the other way. M2 is contained in M1 also, so M1 equal to M2. Okay. So this this particular observation we are going to use towards the very end, in in a very nice way. Okay, so what we have shown is if you have two free modules, one is contained in the other, then there is a division property for the discriminant. And moreover, if the discriminants differ by a unit, then M1 is actually equal to M2. So remember this. Now but let sir, us. Sir, yeah. unit, why should, uh, how are you getting that if the determinants divide each other, then M2 is a subset of M1? No, 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 no. So maybe I said something uh, not quite correct. The proof is, I'm not saying that. Uh, that I that I if I have said that I with, withdraw that statement. The correct proof is because they differ by a unit. This u is determinant of x square, right? Because u is a unit, x the determinant of x is a unit, so x is invertible. Okay, yeah, and if yeah. x is invertible, here v equal to x inverse times w. Yeah, okay. that gives you M2 is contained in M1. That is the proof. I think uh, verbally I said something else also, which is not true. So I said the right thing and I also said a wrong thing, wrong thing, withdraw. Okay, good that you asked. Clear, no? So X is invertible as a point. Okay, so therefore M1 equal to M2. And we are going to use this towards the end uh, today itself. Okay, now let's define discriminant of a fractional ID. 
what we have just done is if you have a free module then you have the concept of a discriminant which is well defined up to square of a unit but a fractional ideal need not be free so that definition is not quite correct but then you know you are going to have a temporary definition a tentative definition which is that you choose a basis of e over k with elements from your fractional ideal and take its discriminant you can choose another basis similar basis you can choose you can take that discriminant and take the ideal generated by all these discriminants okay is the definition clear take a basis of e over k with entries from your fractional ideal take all possible such bases and uh, take the corresponding discriminants associated to this basis and take the ideal generated by all these discriminants of all these bases that is by definition the discriminant of a fractional ideal so it need not be free so we are going to define it as discriminant of the a module generated by as discriminant as the a module generated by all d of w as w ranges over basis of e over k such that the basis elements are from the given fractional ideal this is the definition take various bases with entries from your fractional ideal take the corresponding discriminant and take the a module generated by all these things now it turns out that this is a fractional ideal why is that because if b is a fractional ideal of b it's a b of course the definition is it's a b module contained in e such that there is a non zero element c and cb is contained in b this is the definition of a fractional ideal now you are taking a basis of b w a basis of e from b let us say w and you are taking discriminant of w but if that is w1 w2 etc then you know that cw1 cw2 etc are in b right cw1 cw2 etc are in b so if you take this particular module generated by all these discriminants where will this module be contained in this is the a module generated by all these discriminants but discriminants are elements in k downstairs so the module a module generated by all these elements is contained in k contained in k so it's an a module contained in k now the question is is it a fractional ideal can you exhibit can you exhibit something in a an element such that when you multiply this ideal this module with that element it is contained in a can you give such an element so by definition this is an a module it's clearly contained in k because each of this is contained in k so it is generated inside k so it's an a module contained in k i'm claiming that it's actually a fractional ideal so that means you have to exhibit an element of a it's a fractional ideal of a so you have to exhibit an element of a such that let us say b says that b times this is contained in a you want to take a guess what it should be of course it's related to c so given c and b what is the natural element of a associated with c yeah or go by the definition so you have w1 etc wn a basis and you are taking cw1 cw2 etc right so what is sigma 1 of cw1 it is sigma 1 c sigma 1 w1 so everywhere you are getting sigma. so first row you are getting sigma 1 c common second row you are getting sigma 2 c common etc so in terms of matrices you are taking a scalar matrix with diagonal elements sigma 1 c sigma 2 c etc and then you are multiplying with the original thing that's what you are doing so at the level of discriminant what is happening uh, at the level of determinant determinant of this product is determinant product of the determinant norm. yeah it is the norm because the original matrix is a scalar matrix sigma 1 c sigma 2 c etc so norm of c times each of these discriminants is contained in a so norm of c will do the job so discriminant of this fractional ideal is contained in k 
and moreover norm c is such that norm c times the dis discriminant of b is contained in a so claim is that discriminant of b is a fractional ideal of a okay so everything is nice you have uh, something upstairs a fractional ideal then we have a definition of the discriminant and that automatically is a fractional ideal downstairs okay all right good so uh, localization so what may be what am i recalling here can you just fill the sentence before i come to the slide i'm saying we have seen in lecture 16 lecture 16 is just last lecture and the title of the slide is localization so what am i going to say what did we see with respect to localization and i think i left it as an exercise i didn't do it i said it's obvious you check it what was the statement if you have all these notations and if you have a multiplicative set s contained in a then you can consider s inverse a and s inverse b and the different of that that is same as different of b with respect to a and localize that id so we have seen that different behaves well with respect to localization and you have this identity different of s inverse b over s inverse a is localization of the different different of the localization is localization of the different s is a multiplicative subset of a similarly you can check here similarly if b is a fractional ideal of b and s is a multiplicative subset of a you can check that the discriminant of s inverse b is s inverse of the discriminant the discriminant of the localization is the localization of the discriminant this also you check this also is easy straight from the definition exactly as you check here you can check here. okay so please check so different behaves well with respect to localization discriminant also behaves well with respect to localization this is very very useful because all these things are useful because discriminants of fractional ideals of dvrs we can check if you want to study for dedekind domain you choose a prime localize at that prime then a subscript p becomes a dvr and what is a great advantage if ap is a dvr what will happen is now bp over ap is finitely generated and ap is a pid so bp becomes free and if bp becomes free the uh, studying discriminant is much easier right because for a free module there's no ambiguity it's much easier you don't have to take the ideal generate i mean module generated by various things etc it's much easier just pick one basis and then do it so this is the advantage so it's enough to study discriminants of fractional ideals of dvrs if p is contained in a we can compute the p component of the discriminant by localizing at p what do i mean by the p component of the discriminant discriminant is a fractional ideal discriminant is a fractional ideal so you can factorize because you are in a dedekind domain you can write it as a product of uh, prime ideals where the power may be positive or negative because it's a fractional id and uh, at p you can look at so the p component of the discriminant is the discriminant of the localization so the question of studying discriminant in general exactly as in different this is exactly what happened in for different if you want to study different of b over a you can localize at various primes and you can study the Di different of the localization and uh, you can put all that together and you will get the global different so you have the global different and you have the local different similarly here okay so ap is a pid fractional ideals of b are free ap modules right because a fractional ideal is a five fractional ideal is a module it is finitely generated because everything is noetherian and uh, therefore you have a finitely generated module over ap but ap is a pid therefore uh, it is free there's no torsion that's easy to check for fractional ideals there's no torsion so these are free modules and uh, as bp has only finitely many primes why bp has only finitely many primes because bp is over ap and ap is a dvr it has only one prime so only primes lying above p are primes of bp and 
above one prime there are only finitely many primes therefore bp has altogether only finitely many primes and therefore you can conclude that bp is also a pid we have checked that a dedekind domain with only finitely many prime ideals is a pid so this is also a pid bp is also a pid okay so now let us do dvr because without loss of generality we can come to dvr so if a is a dvr and if you take a fractional ideal of course it's a pid b is a pid and uh, therefore it's generated by a single element beta in e and then we are going to claim that the discriminant of this fractional ideal is discriminant of the ring times norm of this element beta it's square okay this should be easy can you see the proof just apply the definition so b is yeah the proof is that you take b is a free module over a take a basis that basis gives you discriminant of b right now beta times elements of that basis will give a basis for this so that will give you discriminant of b but how are they differing it is beta times w1 beta times w2 etc so so if you apply the definition of the discriminant you will have sigma 1 beta sigma 2 beta etc in the diagonal that scalar matrix so its uh, determinant is norm of beta and discriminant is norm of beta uh, determinant square so norm of beta square so that's a proof it's obvious so indeed if v is the basis of b over a then w is x times v Uh, where x is diagonal sigma one beta etc sigma n beta, so that determinant is norm of beta, and uh, you are taking the square. So this follows, and therefore in general you have a similar result. Let A be any Dedekind domain, and let B be a fractional ideal of B. What is the definition of the discriminant of B now? This is the A module generated by discriminants of various bases with entries from B. That's the definition. and we are claiming exactly the same statement discriminant of b is norm of b but here norm meaning norm of an ideal b is an ideal b is a fractional ideal and we have the concept of norm of a fractional ideal how did we define norm you define norm of a prime ideal as the ideal lying below to the power residue degree and extended multiplicatively that's how we define the norm and with that definition you have this and uh, proof is easy because already for dvrs we have seen it in the last slide and proving for dvr is enough because of localization because the discriminant is the p component of the discriminant is the discriminant of the localization and so each p component this identity is true so this is a product of our primes this is a product of our primes this is a product of our primes and at each prime this identity is true that we have already seen and therefore this is true So for each p component, this is true, and therefore true in general. Okay, so we have this nice identity, and this we are going to use. This identity we are going to use to show that norm of the different is discriminant. This is different. What is the definition of different? Do you recall? Different is the inverse of b prime. and what is b prime the dual lattice of b the complementary module of b how did we define the complementary module if l is any additive group of e l prime is defined as all those elements such that trace of xl is contained in a and we had many results about uh, complementary modules or dual lattices and uh, we defined b prime and b prime inverse was the definition of different so it is an ideal of b you can take its norm that will be an ideal downstairs on the other hand this is an ideal right this is yeah this is an ideal why is this an ideal because uh, yeah we define for any fractional ideal right for any fractional ideal we define the discriminant and we prove that the discriminant is a fractional ideal so discriminant of b is a fractional ideal but discriminant of b is contained in a we have seen this it's contained in k and it belongs to it's also contained in b so b intersection k and that is a 
So this is a fractional ideal contained in A. Therefore, it is a genuine ideal. It's an integral ideal. So norm of the different is an ideal, discriminant is an ideal. As ideals, there is this equality. So let's prove this. So strategy once again is to localize because both different and discriminant uh, behaves well with respect to localization. So we can localize and prove it. Both sides are well behaved with respect to localization. So we can assume that A is a DVR. And if A is a DVR, then uh, B is a free module over A. And B is also a PID in fact. But we are going to use the fact that B is a free A module. Because B is anyway finitely generated because A is a PID, B is free. Okay, B is a free A module. And uh, if it is free, what is the advantage? Pick a basis. Pick a basis and compute its discriminant. So discriminant of B is generated by discriminant of W. Up to square of a unit, it is actually discriminant of W. So it is generated by this. Now consider W prime because after all, different involves prime, different involves B prime and prime is, you know, in many computations of the prime, we use the dual basis. So consider W prime. What is W prime? What is W prime? What is the notation W prime? W is that? Yeah. Go ahead. Dual basis. Dual basis with respect to trace. With respect to the trace by linear form. Okay. So uh, consider W prime. Recall that this is the dual basis of W with respect to the trace by linear form. And everything now falls nicely. It's very beautiful. We know that the dual lattice B prime is generated by W prime, right? You remember if L is A V1 plus etc. A V R, then L prime is A V1 prime plus etc. A V R prime. The dual, if if you have a lattice, then the dual of the lattice, dual lattice is generated by dual basis. So therefore B prime is generated by W prime. So what we have is discriminant of B is generated by discriminant of W and discriminant of B prime, right? Discriminant we have defined for any fractional ideal and B prime is a fractional ideal and discriminant of B prime is generated by discriminant of W prime from what we have seen earlier. So discriminant of B is generated by discriminant of W and discriminant of B prime is generated by discriminant of W prime. Now tell me how are discriminant of W and discriminant of W prime related? You have a basis, you have a dual basis. How are the discriminants related? You want to take a guess? In fact, if you look at the definition, it's clear. But even otherwise, Can you show the previous slide? Hmm? Previous slide? This one. No, but uh, the, my question has nothing to do with this slide. My question is a linear algebra question. The point is we are going to use this. Discriminant of B is generated by discriminant of W. Discriminant of B prime is generated by discriminant of W prime. But this question has nothing to do with all that. W is a basis. W prime is a dual basis with respect to the trace by linear form. So how are these discriminants related? So what is the definition of this discriminant? You take the matrix sigma i w j, where sigma i's are the embeddings of E and K bar. And you take the determinant and take its square. That was the definition. Now you have the dual basis also. So how will they be related? Maybe you need pen and paper. You can take a two by two matrix and see what happens. It's quite easy actually. Okay, so maybe in the interest of time, let me do it. What you can check is, you can take this matrix, sigma i w j prime, and you can take this matrix, sigma i w j, and it's transpose. If you multiply these two, you will get the identity matrix. Right? This is easy to check, because if you take the transpose here, and when you multiply, what you will get, is exactly the bilinear form. So if you if, if the trace bilinear form, if you call B dot comma dot, then what you will get is B V B W I W J prime. So diagonals will be one and the rest will be zero because your bilinear form is trace, right? 
what you have is sigma 1 so diagonal element will be sigma 1 of v1 w1 plus sigma 2 of v1 w1 etc so what you are getting is trace of v1 w1 the first element will be trace of v1 w1 which is 1 second element will be trace of v1 w v not v1 w1 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 prime then you will have w1 w2 prime that is 0 etc so it's easy to check it is the identity matrix therefore the determinant if you take and square discriminant of w times discriminant of w prime is 1 therefore what can you conclude about discriminant of b and discriminant of b prime discriminant of w times discriminant of w prime is 1 therefore discriminant of b times discriminant of b prime is a okay so now we are in good shape because of this and we have proved that we have this identity discriminant of a fraction any fractional ideal is norm of that ideal squared times the discriminant of the ring b and uh, in this you put b equal to b prime b equal to b prime what will you get here you will get discriminant of b prime here you will get norm of b prime square here you have discriminant of b but what is discriminant of b prime discriminant of b prime is discriminant of b inverse right these two are ideals and the product is identity so discriminant of b prime is discriminant of b inverse so what you are getting is discriminant of b inverse is norm of b prime square times discriminant of b in other words norm of b prime square if you bring it to this side and discriminant b inverse to this side you will get discriminant b square equal to norm of b prime power minus 2 but what is norm of b prime power minus 2 what is b prime inverse b prime inverse is the different so norm of b prime power minus 2 is norm of different square so you get norm of different square equal to discriminant square but if two ideals are such that i square equal to j square then what can you conclude about i and j if you have ideals i and j if the squares are equal then what can you say they are equal right this is same as asking if i square is identity then what is i then i is identity in the kind of means clearly yes, yes. so so this implies norm of di different is discriminant so this is a wonderful relationship between different and discriminant so ramification can be studied using different or discriminant and uh, these two are related by norm norm map okay these are very important uh, concepts and uh, yeah let's do a little bit more so you fix an element alpha uh, of e uh, alpha in e of degree n over k and we are going to define a notion of different of an element so it's a new notion this is not what we have done earlier we are going to define different of alpha to be product of alpha minus sigma alpha where sigma is all the non-identity galois conjugates all the non-identity elements sigma sigmas are the embeddings of e into k bar and take except the identity map take all the other things and take alpha minus sigma alpha and discriminant you have the usual definition discriminant of an element is the take the obvious basis generated by alpha and take the discriminant now you can check that uh, you have this relationship this is easy to check okay so you do that okay so this is a typo bracket missing please remind me at the end of the lecture and uh, so norm of this is the element wise norm because this is an element so this is a field norm field norm of this notion of different actually matches with discriminant up to a sign and the sign is exactly this you just have to apply the definition there's nothing much here so here you have the notion of different so this will be the corresponding matrix will be one alpha etc alpha power n minus one one alpha one alpha one square etc one alpha two alpha two square etc where alpha is are the other conjugates now what are the sigma sigma sends alpha to alpha one another sigma sends alpha to alpha two etc so this also you can expand like that and apply the norm map here you will see that the, you will see that it will be up to this sign it will be a certain square 
and that inside bracket thing is exactly the Vandermont determinant. It's just, you know, Vandermont determinant. So if you know how to play with the Vandermont determinant, this follows. Okay, so it's a type of work. Okay, good. So now, if you have, and so I'm I'm coming to uh, ramification. So if alpha is an element of D and P is a prime of A, and suppose, so you take, so you have the discriminant of this element alpha, and you have discriminant of your ring B, you can take this quotient, and suppose P does not divide this. So this should be thought of as a fractional ideal, and suppose P does not divide that fractional ideal. What is the meaning of this? This means you cancel the common factors and write in lowest terms and P doesn't divide the numerator. That's the meaning. Okay, so if P doesn't divide this, then uh, BP is generated over AP by one element alpha. If you recall from chapter one onwards, we had strong properties. We had strong results. If you know your element is generated by, if your ring is generated by one element and we are getting a condition for that in terms of in terms of the discriminant, not divisible by P. What is the proof? This is the very first observation that we have done about M1 contained in M2, and I had a criterion to conclude M1 equal to M2. Use that. So call M1 equal to AP alpha and M2 equal to BP. Are we in that situation? Are M1 and M2 free modules? AP is a localization, so AP is a DVR. Therefore, uh, M1 and M2 are free modules, right? These are finitely generated modules over a PID, so free. So M1 and M2 are free, and what is the containment? M1 is contained in M2. You want to claim that M1 equal to M2, but we know that M1 is clearly contained in M2. So we have free AP modules. One more typo, this is capital M1. So free AP modules, capital M1 contained in capital M2, and uh, you have the divisibility property like this, right? determinant discriminant of m2 divides discriminant of m1 they differ by a u where what is u u is a change of basis thing not change of basis you write this basis in terms of this basis and you will get a corresponding matrix it is the determinant of that and the square so that belongs to a u belongs to a so in this case u belongs to ap because these are modules over ap u belongs to ap now what is what is given to you so discriminant of M1 and discriminant of M2 differ by a U. And what is discriminant of M1? Discriminant of M1 is discriminant of this module, which is exactly discriminant of alpha. So what is given to you is that P does not divide discriminant of M1. So P does not divide this. And therefore, P does not divide U. P does not divide U. In other words, U is a unit. So our assumption, what is given to you is that U is a unit. Agree with this uh, statement? U is an element of AP, but this says P doesn't divide this. This is discriminant of M1. So P doesn't divide discriminant of M1. So P doesn't divide this and P doesn't divide this. In particular, P doesn't divide this. But P doesn't divide this the same as saying U is a unit in AP. But if U is a unit, if these two discriminants differ by a unit, then we have concluded that M1 equal to M2. Therefore, M1 equal to M2. That's what we wanted to prove. BP equal to AP alpha. Okay. So the remark is that this is a local result. I am localizing and at the level of DVR, I have shown that M1 equal to M2. But this also gives you a corresponding global result. If this is true for each prime P, if this is true for each prime P, then you can write B equal to A bracket alpha. The corresponding global result is true. If for each localization M1 is M2, then globally M1 is M2. This we have done long back. So we recall this. So I am repeating the slide. So this is page 5 of lecture 11. Let A be a dedicated domain and let B be a prime in A and SP is this multiplicative set. This is copy paste. This we have done long back. Suppose M and N are modules over A such that the localization of M is contained in localization of N, then the claim is for all primes P, then M is contained in N. 
So in particular, if the localizations agree at all primes P, then they agree. So we have got a statement. So this result is global. If this condition is true for all primes P, then B equal to A alpha, A bracket alpha. Because locally you have proved this and this is true for all primes. If this is true for all primes, then globally this is true. Because here we have proved locally M1 is N2 and this we have proved earlier that at every prime if you have equality, at every prime if you have containment, then you have global containment. So in other words, so in particular, if at every prime if you have equality, then you have global equality. Let me just uh, recall this proof because uh, we are doing too many things. So let's let's quickly recall what was the proof this we have done already. So if A is in M, I have to show that A is in N. If A is in M, then A belongs to SP inverse M. So you can write it as a linear combination, SP inverse M, which is contained in SP inverse N. And write A equal to XP by SP, where XP belongs to N and SP belongs to SP because of this. Okay, now you have to show that A belongs to N and the step is consider the ideal generated by these SPs. So what is the meaning of this? What are these SPs? You take any element of M, correspondingly you get an SP, you take another element, etc. No, no, this element is fixed. So, SP varies. You fix an element A and uh, localize with respect to P, so you can write it as XP by SP for the given P. As P varies, take a different prime, write it as XP by SP for that and take all those denominators together and consider this ideal. And uh, the question is, can this be a proper ideal of A? No, no. No, because SPs are outside P. SPs are outside P. So this cannot be a proper ideal. So this has to be, this has to be the full ring. So this has to be the full ring. So therefore, in particular, one can be written as, it is a full ring, so one belongs to this ideal generate one belongs to B. So one is one can be written as summation YP SP, a finite sum with YP in A. And now we are done because now A is right, A is uh, XP by SP. So A is XP by SP, and uh, A can be written as A times one and one is summation YPSP. So this is XP by SP times YPSP. So A YPSP, which is YPXP, and YPs are in A and XPs are in, XPs are in N. YPs are in A, XPs are in N, therefore the product is in N and their sum is in N. So you have concluded that A belongs to N. This was a proof. Okay. So, so this is important, right? Because under the condition B equal to A bracket alpha, we had many nice results. We had explicit factorization of prime, for example. Explicit factorization of prime ideals was under this condition. And maybe some other things also we have proved under this condition. So we have got a nice way to check whether this condition is true in terms of the discriminants. One more remark, this I would uh, leave it. You can check that this is the condition, right? This is the condition. If this is true for all primes, then B equal to A alpha. If this is true for one prime, then BP is AP alpha. So this was the condition in terms of the different. You can reformulate it in terms of the different. This was about discriminant. You can reformulate it in terms of the different. And this is equivalent to you can go upstairs. So this is some condition downstairs. Discriminant is a downstairs phenomenon. P is a prime downstairs. How do you go up? Corresponding ideal up is PB, the ideal generated by P in B. And this is a relative prime condition and it is equivalent to this being relatively prime to instead of discriminant, this different of alpha is the different notion of different that we introduced here. This is uh, product of, this is the difference. This also is called different of alpha. 
okay so it is related to that uh, it is related to that like this yeah what is f prime alpha f is the minimal polynomial of alpha and this is a formal derivative and then plug it in so pb relatively prime to this is equivalent to this thing so you need to check this after all different and discriminant are related by a nice condition it is a sign times up to a sign they agree up to a sign they agree and uh, discriminant of alpha and the different are also related because if you remember f prime alpha comes in the definition of b prime and b prime inverse is different and norm of different and discriminant are related so these two equivalence you can show using the norm norm map using the norm map now let me state so i want to end this chapter and move to the next chapter there's not so much time remaining april has started so i'm going to state two results and i'm skipping the proof not that it's very difficult to anything we could have done but i don't want to you know spend too much time on this chapter i would like to move to another chapter uh, another chapter i don't mean chapter 4 i will move to chapter 5 now chapter 4 i will skip okay and that will be the last chapter that we cover so this is uh, what is called stickelberger's criterion so i'm going to state this and uh, if problems are there you can use this criterion this criterion is useful in checking this condition right if you can check this condition then it's a nice thing in order to compute ring of integers you know that it is generated by one element if this condition is true so whether p divides discriminant or not is an important uh, thing to check and this condition may be sometimes useful so the condition is this if e over q is of degree n and suppose this set alpha 1 etc alpha n all are algebraic integers containing oe and suppose this set is linearly independent then uh, the criterion says that the discriminant of this set alpha 1 etc alpha n discriminant is either 0 mod 4 or 1 mod 4 always so not 2 uh, mod 4 or 3 mod 4 okay so p dividing the discriminant p divides discriminant or not you can use this criterion many times you can you know choose these elements and you know that this is either 0 mod 4 or 1 mod 4 so in problems this criterion may be useful i'm skipping the proof so check lang it has a very simple three four lines proof you can check it and uh, what could be my remark yeah whenever a name comes we check wikipedia so stickelberger i did not know this earlier i checked only today ludwig stickelberger 1815 to 50 to 1936 was a swiss mathematician so very rarely we are getting people outside germany of course it's all and austria these are all neighboring countries and uh, we had krasner in france or russia and uh, we had van der waarden yeah rarely we went outside and uh, this is one more so stickelberger is a swiss mathematician okay so last result uh, for today and then we will stop and this also we will skip the proof proof is there in lang and this is again see one 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 thing that we should be able to do is to actually compute the ring of integers for example maybe i said it long ago or uh, you can check it easy in quadratic extensions if you have a quadratic extension of q let us say q root d then you can ask what is its ring of integers and for example for z for q root 3 ring of integers is z bracket root 3 whereas if you take q root 5 ring of integers is bigger than z root 5 it is actually z plus it is actually z uh, no uh yeah so uh, the question is 1 plus root 5 by 2 1 plus root 5 by 2 is an algebraic integer no no yeah 1 plus root 5 by 2 right that's an algebraic integer no x square plus x plus 1 no that is minus 1 plus root 5 by 2 yeah minus 1 plus root 5 by 2 and therefore 1 plus root 5 by 2 1 plus root 5 by 2 is an algebraic integer so and that does not belong to z root 5 so the answer is z bracket 1 plus root 5 by 2 you must have done this kind of examples in uh, marcus 
So calculating ring of integers is an important part of this course. And uh, many times we can say B is A bracket alpha and discriminant is playing an important role. Here is one more one more result about calculating the ring of integers. So suppose K and E are number fields which are linearly disjoint. Do you recall what is linearly disjoint? There are many equivalent conditions. One condition is that if you take a basis for K over Q and a basis for E over Q, all these products will form a basis for the composite. So if WIs are a basis for K over uh, Q and if VIs are a basis for uh, E over Q, then WI VJs will form a basis. So if this is degree M and this is degree N, then KE in particular is of degree mn over q okay so whatever basis you take the product the all products if you take that should be a basis for ke that's called linearly disjoint assume so suppose they are linearly disjoint and suppose the discriminants are relatively prime what is the discriminant of k you fix a basis and take its discriminant that is Fix an integral basis and take its discriminant. So that's fix an integral basis and take its discriminant. So this is uh, something in A. This is something in A and it is well defined modulo square of a unit. And, uh, and assume that these two discriminants, discriminant of K and discriminant of E, discriminant of an integral basis. Okay. So suppose they are relatively prime. And then you can conclude that the ring of integers of the composite in KE is ring of integers of K times ring of integers of E. So ring of integers is nice. And moreover, you have a formula for the discriminant of KE. Note this, it is discriminant of K to the power the degree of E times discriminant of E to the power degree of K. You're not surprised to see this, no? This kind of a phenomenon you must have seen in linear, linear algebra many times, right? After all, we are doing linear algebra because the determinant is involved in discriminant. And you must have seen this kind of a thing in linear algebra, no? What, 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 what does this remind you of? Discriminant of K, the power is the degree of E. And discriminant of E, the power is degree of K. It's, it's ultra. I mean, it's, it's after, a, after a switching. What does this remind you of? What does this remind you of? In Nothing, like I don't know. No? In linear algebra, you know the determinant of a matrix. So, determinant of, okay, maybe you don't know. You know tensor product of matrices, no? No. Okay. So, but uh, maybe you know you called it Kronecker product or something? Of matrices? Yeah, of matrices. Well, maybe uh, have you seen uh, tensor product of vector spaces? Yeah. Yeah, then you have a similar, uh, certainly a notion of tensor product of matrices. No. If you have tensor product of vector spaces, then you can suppose you have V and W and if you have V tensor W, then you can consider an operator. You can take an operator on V and operator on W and you can take the tensor product of those two operators. No. Yeah. Correspondingly, you will get the tensor product of the fixed basis. So if you have EI a basis of V, VI a basis of V and WI a basis of W, then VI tensor WJ will be a basis of the tensor product. And in that tensor product, you can write down the matrix. No? So that will be the tensor product of matrices. Okay. So in what? That case, determinant will be the product, no? Determinant of product is product. Yeah. Already. Yeah. But now we are taking not. So determinant of AB is determinant of A times determinant of B. Now I am asking what is the determinant of A tensor B? What will be the size of A tensor B? If A is a 2 by 2 matrix and B is a 3 by 3 matrix. What will be the size of A tensor B? 6 cross 6. 6 cross 6. And what will be the determinant of that matrix? Uh, 
Okay, this you can uh, actually uh, compute use. I mean, uh, using the definition of determinant. But in order to guess it, you take the simplest matrix. So take scalar matrix. Take a two by two scalar matrix. Say lambda, lambda, and uh, take uh, a three by three scalar matrix. Say mu, mu, mu. So what will be the tensor product? That again will be a scalar matrix, right? And what will be the diagonal elements? Lambda mu, uh -huh. lambda mu. So what? Yeah, lambda. The, so the determinant will be. Lambda power six, mu power six. Yes, lambda power six, mu power six. So what is it in terms of determinant of the first matrix okay. and determinant of the second matrix? Uh, determinant of the first matrix cube into determinant of the second. Correct. So it's it's swapping, right? So it is lambda square times three determinant of uh, the size of B, and it is uh, determinant of A times size of power size of B. And determinant of d power size of a. So this is not uh, unexpected. You should get this easily. It's exactly that thing. Okay. So we will stop here, and uh, let me uh, stop the recording. And I think there are one or two typos which I'll correct. Uh, taking your help. First, let me stop recording.